welcome to the CollectingCars.com podcast with Chris Harris and Edward Lovett. Hello and welcome to another Collecting Cars podcast over the Zoom. Uh, sorry about my slightly dingy background. Edward's got the lovely Collecting Cars logo. And we are here with the third party, Ian Litchfield of Litchfield Motors, a uh, friend of mine for 20 years or more. Um, someone who's well known to people that have loved anything from a Subaru to a Nissan GTR to latterly BMW M cars uh, and more and more and more. He's a, I, I suppose he's one of the country's preeminent tuners um, and currently has a monopoly on R35 tuning in the UK, it would seem. Um, but as you can probably guess, um, there's a reason for getting this together now. We were going to do it a while ago, uh, but we wanted to do it face to face. However, yesterday um, I caused a bit of a kerfuffle with a, a tweet that I put out. Um, about an interaction that Ian had had over his uh, newly developed Yaris GR, or is it GR Yaris, uh, suspension kit. So we thought we'd, um, we'd get him on to have a quick chat about that. This is not going to be entirely about that issue because there's lots to talk about with Ian um, that's positive and fun. And, and fundamentally, ours is not a serious industry. We just mess around with cars. So we're not going to get too lost in the, um, what we think was the seriousness of yesterday's tweet, because it, it wasn't really. I, I state now that nothing to do with cars is really serious, but it's all a bit of fun and a good bit of joshing. And I do think it's helpful to to add some checks and balances sometimes within our world. And just and to, I'm I'm not I'm not a gatekeeper. I'm not a policeman. I don't see myself like that at all. I'm just like anyone else. However, um, I think it's sometimes interesting to look around and question the way we all treat each other and the practices that we're involved with. So, Mr. Litchfield. Before we go into your fascinating backstory, um, yesterday I asked you whether I could put that tweet up because um, we'd had a little conversation. Um, and for those that haven't seen the tweet, I said that someone had approached Ian um, and said, I've got, uh, I'm an influencer, I've got a Yaris GR. You can put your suspension on the car and I'll write about it, but I'll be wanting a sum of money, which was not unadjacent to 25,000 pounds and, uh, and some and some percentage of the sales of the kit going forwards. Um, and you quite rightly said, that's not very appealing to me because we do quite well without that. Um, but you said I could put the tweet up. Most people wouldn't have let me, but I think um, that you felt that these kind of approaches are, they're fine. They're not, you know, ultimately they're just asking for something and you have a right to say no, but it, it's endemic of the fact that the industry is a bit skewed at the moment. Would you agree? Yeah, I think it crossed the line. Um, they'd asked for help with a project, which we're happy to help with. We we uh, we spoke to them because we want to know when they want to do it more than anything else, more of a timing issue. And then they proceeded to sort of explain how they would uh, they'd want additional payment over and above any discount we might be able to provide on the kit for their car, uh, as well as future sales. And it they spoke to one of my colleagues, and I didn't sort of take it in properly at first until I sort of asked to listen to the, the recording. And I just got more and more annoyed by, <laughs> by the brazenness of it. I mean, it, it was, as I said to you before, it's like a, like a double glazing salesman trying to fleece an old lady. It was, it was bizarre how um, they were asking. So it just got me really cross, really, about the whole thing, because we've dealt with so many other good people over the years that we've not really had this much. And I think the, that world runs the risk of crossing lines that do people realize that they're being paid as much as they are for promoting what they do? If, if, if we'd gone to them and said, we'd like you to promote our product, then absolutely they can charge whatever they like. That's, that's not an issue, but they approached us and then sort of tried to shake us down for the, for the additional money. Um, I think it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, everyone is, is out to earn a few quid. If, if you work in, in my space, your space, they're not doing it for free, okay? We're trying to make some money, collecting cars, trying to make some money ultimately. But I, I think you've got to just um, understand the risk and reward relationship there. I actually, I'm not going to name this, this person or you know organization, whatever they want to call themselves, because um, that's not the way it works. Um, but my view is school of hard knocks, really. If you stick your head above the parapet and you and you are that punchy to engage with someone and say well let's get involved in a project and then and then you know a little way into it say well actually we want this money and this going forwards and you get called out i think you just take it on the chin don't you and put your hands up and go yeah 
might have got that bit wrong and we've lived to fight another day. I, just, I think it's nothing more than that. Um, it appears to have been silenced so far, so that'll be interesting to see whether we do hear anything. Um, I suppose it, it, it's difficult not to sound like an old fart. Ian, we've been doing this a long time. I mean, I've had bits and bobs off you for ages. And, and, and I'll be absolutely clear. Ian, as people know, uh, works on my, has done stuff to my M2 competition. He's done stuff to lots of my cars over the years. And, um, and you, some you've of You've never it, asked for it for free. You've never said to me, I want it for free and I want money. Or it, we'd happily mates rates do you a deal on something which we but is that many am, I a mug, am i a mug for, for not doing that i mean i've got to ask all questions well, should, should, am i a mug you know i've got a reasonable audience should i be charging you money well, my view no, is I, I shouldn't no you shouldn't and and we've had so for example we had you know um sam from scene through glass yeah he contacted us i don't know a year 18 months ago said could we do some tuning on his carerity at no point did he ask me to do something for free for him the, the commodity he was selling was his video. So he asked, would we mind if, if he did a video while he's with us? Well, that's that's the value for him. So he came along, he paid his money for the exhaust system and the remap. Um, I think maybe we gave him the, the dyno run for free or something like that. It was, it was it's nothing really. And and then he did a video because that's, that's what he earns his money off. And that works perfectly. Last week we had um, Gordon Shedden ask us to tune one of his BMWs for a company he works for. At no point did he leverage the fact that he's a touring car driver and he's this, that and the other and he wants stuff for free. Um, so when when a, an influencer contacts you and says, can I have some product for our project car? We'll naturally look to help them out if we can. But it was a bit much when they asked for a lump sum and future sales. We don't know how much money they think is in Toyota suspension. I mean, <laughs> Bizarre. That's the other thing. That's it's the other just thing. crazy. Let's be let's be honest here. How many Yaris GRs will they sell in the UK? A thousand maximum, maybe seven hundred at best. How yeah. what percentage of those are going to be tuned? Probably less than twenty percent. So what what's the total sum you might make profit on some Yaris GR suspension? It's probably not twenty five grand. Is it? Let's face it. <laughs> no. So so what so what so the offer to you is you can make a loss on your total Yaris GR suspension development program to be associated with us. It's not that attractive, is it? Well, yeah, well, when you put them into context of the, the other people we deal with over the years, they, you know, I'm sure they, it's, they're doing very well, but it's not quite the same. And no, none of the other people that have any kind of uh, coverage have ever asked us for free things. You know? No, I find it yeah, funny, well, Ian, no. when we, we spoke a week ago and I think you, well, I was said, could I come and have a drive in one of the cars at s some point? And you said, well, you, well not at the moment because they're all out with the press. Now, the press don't charge you. you know, Harry's Garage doesn't charge you to go and do a load of views no. on his channel. It's, it, it's kind of, it's dumb. Which, which I, the, 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 that's the other thing. And, and I've been talking about it a lot recently. And Chris and I have touched on it that there's so many people now on on all these different mediums, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, et cetera, that are talking about the products. By the time the third, fourth, fifth person down the road has done another video on a Litchfield Yaris, oh, it all gets a bit boring. Yeah. It's a bit over, you only need one guy or maybe two to do a great video on a Yaris and it's kind of done. Let, let one get on and start enjoying their cars. Yeah, I think it's, you know, if you'd imagine, we've been lucky enough to do things like keep, uh, Evo Car of the Year or Auto Car, Driver's Car of the Year over the years. And if Evo Magazine rang me up and said, we really enjoyed your Subaru back in 2005, would you like to come on Car of the Year? And, oh, but by the way, it's going to cost you 25,000 quid. And if you sell any future Subarus, we want a kickback. I mean, you'd never take it seriously. Do you mean it's crazy? So why should this media format be any different? That's the, that's the bit that's bizarre to me. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I completely agree. Um, so I, 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 I can, I can see the brazenness. I think there's another aspect to it that I want to be clear about as well. That that the approach here, and I've, I've spoken to him about this. The approach here was very much a we're trying to work out who to partner with. Now that's 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 a tricky area for me because that that's not someone saying we want the best kit we think the Litchfield kit's the best we want to buy it and stick it on a car what they're saying is we're going to put on this car whatever yields us the best return and the best money so as an end user when you're watching the review of that kit on that Yaris you're not 
it's just not real. That's not someone saying, I think this is the best. It should have a sticker saying, this is the kit that we think yields the most for a YouTube channel about a Yaris GR product. Not when have you ever seen it. them? They're supposed to put, um, this contains commercial advertising, aren't they, on the YouTube video. I, when was the last time you ever saw a YouTuber put contains commercial material or paid nice. for advertising? It just doesn't happen. Well, let's, so go, let's, go back to the, so let's go back to the history of the Blag. So I started doing this sort of mid to late 90s. And it's called the Blag back then. Uh, and uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to open myself to all sorts of criticism on all the usual forums and comment sections. But because I do think it was different to what's happening now. And these, these are the reasons why. Um, first of all, the Blag was really about, you know, phoning people up and trying to get bits and bobs for your car. Quite often it was a long-term test car for a magazine or it was a car that you had yourself that you wrote about in the magazine. So if you had a, an E36 BMW that had done 100,000 miles, you might phone up Michelin and try and get some tyres. And they might give you four tyres and you might say they were great. And that's as far as it went. Um, uh, but you, you tend to be very honest about the reviews of it. You know, if someone gave you, I remember someone giving me some free Dunlops and they were shite. And I just said they were shite. And the Dunlop people phoned me up and said, but we gave you some free tyres. And I said, but they were shite. <laughs> uh, and, and, and they obviously they never gave me any more free tires um but that's as far as it went obviously and a lot of people are conflating advertising within a magazine and and someone taking asking for money to to be involved in a project like this it, it never it never happened like that in that world again i'm open i'm opening myself up here to some criticism also I'm questioning the actions were, were, should we have been charging these people when i did Trying to think back to something I did. I remember doing something with um, PI. I think they were a, a data, a data acquisition motorsport business. You know, they they ran dashboards and data systems for for race cars. And we stuck one on a Lotus Six E. Should I have said to them, "Well, thanks for putting it in the car, but I want twenty thousand pounds for you being there." I suppose looking back, I never asked because I thought it was wrong, because I just thought the, the 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 reciprocity of the industry was comfortable in you being given something to review and giving it exposure and you enjoying it and then and and them actually benefiting benefiting from it none of them had businesses that were making enough money to be able to spend that money with you of course they weren't but maybe i should have been asking for 25 grand maybe that's where i went wrong it would seem with with what happened yesterday that a lot of people don't think that's what should have been happening so the blag went on for ages and ages and ages and sometimes people overstepped the mark and it was always a bit funny because certain journalists were always quite closely aligned with certain products but there was never any big cash sums um i think uh exchanging uh hands and i and i also i think there was advocacy i think i don't think people were saying stuff was good because it got them some money i think there, there was an honesty about it there always was um of course it wasn't you know fault free but it but it, it was honest um whereas this uh, this this business is is so out of it's out of shape really I can't, does it make me angry no not really because as i've said the car world's not that serious but i think it's a shame um when people do this and i and i agree with i agree with something we discussed before we came on the recording if you want to go to a car maker a big car maker that makes you know turns over billions of euros a year and get yourself a chunk of cash for, for being a shrill for their product, fine. That's absolutely fine. It seems that all these people do that anyway. I mean, I, I can't do that because I, I want to be independent and I want to have a voice. And you can't have an independent voice if you're taking money from any car manufacturer. But, uh, but I, think, I think that it, that there seems to be, there is a line that if you're going to go to a car company and get paid a shed load of money to compromise yourself, that's fine. You, you know, you've got to look yourself in the mirror. If you can do that and take the money, that, I don't I don't care at all. That's that's who you are and, and be comfortable with it. But to go to small independent businesses that are quite clearly not going to be making an awful lot of money out of developing a suspension system for a car that not many people are going to buy, let alone tune, I think you're taking the piss, is my honest answer. Um, yeah, and maybe, I, you know, and I think the, uh, we, we, you know, when you have a business like Ian's, you're a friend of the car community. You're a fellow petrol head, that we're, and we're all on the same level. And it's about sharing the love if it's something you truly believe in. And, and I think that that's that's where where it should stay. That relationship. It's a it's a strange world, the influencer space, because in many ways, people of our age are dinosaurs. We don't understand the way it works. Uh, and I trip over the whole time. I bought some headphones. About a year ago, I went to the Bristol when we could still move around because I quite like my hi-fi. I went to the Bristol 
hi-fi show now that if you want to see people with wearing interesting clothes go there <laughs> they make they make Licho look like bloody Giorgio Armani and uh, so I've gone in there and I bought some headphones and one of those fancy high-res players uh, music players with my with my eldest son because we quite like listening to music and I thought let's try I've never had a headphone setup and these headphones are made by a company called Focal which is the parent company that that's part of a I think a large venture fund that bought name audio and I love name hi-fi um, all of which I've paid for um, and the Focals I bought you know, over the counter. During the summer lockdown, I took a photo of myself with my Focal headphones, largely because I was bored. I gave one else was and put it up. And everyone assumed that I'd been paid to take this photograph. I was like, well, you've got to put a sponsored content. I mean, you, you realise that you're going mad when you think, I'm not, should I post the invoice to show people how much I actually paid for these things? Because every, no one could believe that you would be an advocate for a product that you'd bought, that surely... When, when you're on Instagram, you only put photos of stuff that you've been told to put up there because you've been paid for it. It's, it's almost reverse engineered now that people are, people are shocked that you'd say something nice about something you weren't paid to say. I think that's the problem, isn't it? Is that when, when are people going to... Uh, we had a review come out by uh, Alex Goy today in GQ magazine, and he had to post up that he hadn't been paid for this Don't review. Tell it. it was a genuine review because... This is that's where it ends up descending is that people don't believe anything they read anymore. So ultimately, it ends up ruining what you're trying to do in the first place. Strange. Right. Now, we should we should get on with right. Now let's go to uh, Ian, so Ian let's Sell. go. By the way, if you live in Gloucestershire and you need an MOT, by the look of it, Ian can uh, help we've got, you. We've got we've got it covered. Yeah. MOT <laughs> test centre. <laughs> well, he's got yeah. he's got a um. Let's get rid of that. He's got a he's got a bit of an empire in. But let's go back to the start. So, Ian, born and bred. Thornbury, I love the fact he went to Thornbury. That's spelled F O R N dash B U R Y. Thornbury, um, yeah. Castle School. So you managed to so you managed to escape Castle School. Did, yeah, I did. Did you? I didn't realise until recently that Dan Prosser went to Castle Dan School. Prosser as well, went to, Dan Prosser went to Dan Prosser of Drive Nation and uh, Piston Heads and a good pal of mine. He escaped. Uh, both of us, both of us. But it was actually, it was a very good school back then. Wasn't it, it? it was, a, it is a very good school as far as I'm aware. It's, it's still a very good school. So yes, that was where it, uh, I was kind of, so we moved to Hingham in Norfolk for a few years when I was younger, near uh, near Lotus, and then came back for secondary school back to Thornbury. So when did the car thing start for you? I've always loved cars. Always, it's the only thing I was interested in when I was younger. Uh, that in sport, but mainly cars. Um, and yeah, and then the business started because we, I did a, I had to do a business A level course and um, had to pick a subject that I was interested in. So I, I looked at the car industry and I'd read a, a magazine article in performance car magazines about the Monster Miata where they used to take a V8 engine, put it in an MX5, and they gave a price for it all. So uh, I think it was John Barker wrote the article actually. And, and, um, yeah, it started from there. So I did a business study course on importing a cheaper car from the US and selling it for more money in, in the UK. And we had to present the findings or the, the, the finished result to a bank manager. And then the bank manager would then say whether they would lend you the money for the, for the idea. And I, they said they would, and it was, it was a good idea. So I went back the next week and said, could we borrow the money? And they just laughed and said, <laughs> not a chance. So, yeah. That was it, really. So then it's that I was sort of mortified, and then sort of explaining it to my dad, um, who my mum and dad have absolutely no interest in cars. One's a nurse, and the other worked for a concrete company. And um, but he said, "Well, go back and see if you can get it as a car loan to borrow against." You know, I was 17, 18. So um, with my dad in tow, we went back and said, "Can we borrow a little bit of money to buy a car?" And uh, I went and bought an MX-5 from the US, from America, and it was a disaster, but learned, learned a lot from it, and that's what started it all. So were you selling cars or tuning cars first? You were selling cars first, selling. weren't you? Selling, yeah. Because yeah. So I first cars, came across so... you, I first came across, I remember you first came across my radar almost, almost the same time I started doing these jobs at 98, 7, 97, 98, 99, mm -hmm. around then, I can't remember. Autocar did an article about you know, the future generation or something. And, and, and you were chosen as this, 
I did a special article about you, this 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 guy from Cheltenham, who you must have been, how old were you? 20 years old or something? 21 or probably about 19, 20, yeah. And, and, you, and you were was it you'd sold a Ferrari? I think you sold something, something big. Was it Italian? I can't remember what it was. We sold a three a Ferrari three. I don't even know how they got in contact. I think we used to advertise in the back of auto. Did it? And then they they sort of saw the story from there. But um, yeah, we, we would import cars first and foremost. Um, and we particularly Subarus, we were doing well with Subarus. And then we would do a lot of other cars. Um, and then I would tune my own cars or get my cars tuned. Um, and then customers would naturally ask if we could do the same to theirs. And it sort of snowballed, really. And it sort of dovetailed nicely between, between the two. So I remember you came and test drove our white Spec C. I think it was 2002, 2003. Yeah, there was a Spec and, C, and then the yeah. one that the one that changed it all was I, I had a because when I was the obviously preeminent idiot influencer and decided to try <laughs> and make a name for myself by get my, by get getting over my head and financial difficulties with a Lamborghini Gallardo, <laughs> we did a story where Licho had done this thing called a Type 25, which I thought was brave. So basically, he'd rebranded an, an existing road car, which looking back would have landed you in a load of legal trouble now, but back then you got away with oh, it. Oh, no, we had it back then as well. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. Super UK for a long time were not our friends. But we no. get on very well now. <laughs> but uh, so they had, uh, you know, it was Cosworth tuned engine and it was a, a mega bit of kit. And I and I think I, I said to him, I've driven it. I reckon it's probably better cross country than my bloody Lamborghini that costs 10 times as much. So we went up to the... Crickhowl road on the moors, drove them back to back. And I, I do, I don't know what I wrote, but I think I probably wrote, Yeah, I love this Lamborghini. But if you wanted to actually go fast over a B road or an A road, you'd probably take this, this Subaru. And, uh, and it, that seemed to me to be the changing point. But at that point, you, your name became synonymous with very high quality suspension, engine work. And also, you became a household name in the magazine. You were the one tuner that consistently managed to get the trust of the magazines. We were always quite wary of tuner cars in magazines because for two reasons. One, it's, it's a lot of money to put together one of those big shoots, those group tests. And if a tuner turns up and the car shits itself, it wrecks everything. And normally, it's, you know, if you're on a track, it fires oil everywhere and bits of crankcase. You're there going, oh, this has wrecked it. And the other one is you've got to be very careful. Who you know, If you, if you advocate something as being really good and the readers go to them and actually they turn up and there's just seven Alsatians chained to a fence and a load of people looking to steal money from them. That's not a good look for them. You know, be careful. And you never presented as being like that. Although, you know, there were a few Alsatians. It's not, <laughs> not fine. Um, so, but you but you started going, you, you were always on Evo Car of the Year. And back then, of course, getting getting onto Evo Car of the Year was the Willy, Willy Wonka ticket, wasn't it? In terms of oh, publicity. It was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. I think we were, I mean, we were very lucky that we were dealing with uh, a very good product to begin with that wasn't available here so 90 percent of the work was done by the fact that we were bringing over a, a japanese spec car that was already much better than the uk equivalent so we were then really just rounding off the edges and and titivating it basically not doing anything drastic until the, we did the type 25 and so it, it did extremely well on its own merits to begin with so we did. Uh, we had a red spec C in Evo car the year that won the first sort of round, and then it got taken. We got taken over to Italy to to go up against supercars and things. So um, it was an amazing time. And yeah, if you if you were on an Evo car the year, you were guaranteed to sell quite a few cars afterwards. How many Type Twenty Fives did you make? We did uh, thirty five of the first uh, version and about eighteen, nineteen of the second version. So you have for me, that was huge quantity. Pardon. I've still got, I've got back, a, yeah, I've got, I've got one here that I've kept. I've got a spruce up and I've got a spec C that I, I bought back a few years ago that I'll keep, which is amazing. So yeah, we'll definitely keep that. Were you really Licho, a Subaru man when you knew at heart that the Evo Mitsubishi was better? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I love them both. I don't know why it was about the Subaru. It was, I just, the Subaru, we, 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 did, we, sold, um, we sold Mitsubishi UK their first Evos when they were waiting for some to come over. So we've always had Evos. It's just that we'd sell a lot more Subarus. It was um, slightly more practical on a daily basis. It wasn't quite so manic. Um, yeah, I loved them. But no, the, the Evos were superb as well. I love that era. It was, you know, there was always... 
it seemed like every week there was a new version of either the Subaru or the Evo and the weekly car magazines would have them on the covers and you and the, there'd be stupid group tests and, and comparison tests, which if you weren't really into it, you must have picked the magazine up and thought it was Groundhog Day. Well, didn't they do that last week? No, no, but that's got that's got a lightweight wheel on it. So that 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 demands an entirely different road test. That does. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, and I just it was they were great times. And and looking back, they were so such partisan opinions as well. Then if you if you wore a Mitsubishi jacket and you and you know and you went anywhere near Banbury, you'd have people lobbing dog turds at you because the ProDrive <laughs> people. It was I loved it. It was great. You were either you know you were either Burnsy or you were or McRae or, you know, or, or Tommy Mack, sorry, or McRae. It was, they were great times. But moving on from that, the Subaru thing, what you've always done consistently, without wanting to blow smoke up your ass, because you're quite a modest man, you've always got your eye on the next thing. So I remember talking to you in 0304 and you saying, yeah, this Subaru thing is, is clearly going to die at some point because they're, they're less and less interested in the World Rally Championship. You can tell that. And they're not you know the car doesn't really get developed much it's kind of staying the same um and and you said we need to look for the next thing and sure enough even though you carried on with the uh, what is still actually quite a good look and i don't know the numbers is it an s11 s12 the very the really the hatchback five door mm -hmm. impressor which is quite a, quite a good looking car the one that you ripped the bumper off when we were doing that promotional shoot remember that one <laughs> I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a that was a good car. It needed quite a bit more work than the earlier ones. But uh, in and around that same time is when Nissan released the um the GTR and then things really went fast. And that was and that's 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 when uh that's when you 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 realize that some people are very serious about trying to establish themselves as being the preeminent person in the space. So, I got a phone call from Licho that this uh this is 2007. And uh, end of 2007, he phones me and goes, I've got, I've got one of the first GTR R35s coming over from Japan and uh, we're going to work on it. And if you remember back then, the R35 was, was special for a multitude of reasons. It's performance, it's layout, the fact that it had this twin turbo engine with the DSG gearbox, which until then really only the Veyron had had that, that technology with that level of performance. Um, but the big thing was you can't tune it. The message from... From, from Nissan was you will not be able to crack the ECU. The car can tell whether you're on a track or not. All this stuff was banded around. And uh, so Ian said, I'm bringing one over, which we're going to work on. But before we work on it, do you want to have a go in it? And, uh, and so we, I got this chance to drive this car. And this, this refers back to what we discussed at the beginning of, the, um, of, the, of this podcast. So he's phoned me and said, do you want it? And, and I knew that he would give it to other people because he had a good relationship with Richard Mead and then Jethro Bobbingdon from from uh from evo magazine but i knew i had a weekly outlet so i was going to get to it first because i could get it to print first and it was a massive opportunity for me it was ian saying he's not saying it but tacitly he's saying if you have this car off me i know that you can do a twin test with probably a porsche or a ferrari you can sell it i think myself and james Littman sold that 15 20 times around the world that story that's the way it used to work back then you you went out you you invested some time and, and your own money into a photo shoot and then you sold it around the world to people as content to different magazines and so Licho gave me his car and myself and Lippman made me a load of money but he didn't ask me for a kickback and he didn't ask me whether I'd give him 20 grand for the day to rent the car looking back Licho you missed a touch there mate you yeah, don't know. <laughs> yeah I mean, do you remember taking it around um, Bedford and then with your M3 and then Aston Martin were there and wanted to have a go in the car yeah, um, they were the second people to buy a car off us um, <laughs> after that. Literally, the next day they rang us up and said, "We got another one. We want it." So this, so this is an untuned car at this stage. Totally standard car, yeah, totally. And it just was on a different planet back in late two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight to anything that had gone before it. Um, and so yeah, when Aston drove the car because they were testing, I think they were about to release the V twelve Vantage, and they were doing some shakedown stuff at Bedford, and they just happened to be there. And um, they had a go in it and the chief engineer turned to the other uh, driver and said, you need to have a drive with this Nissan. And they were quite dismissive. And he said, no, you have to go and drive this car. And the guy said, OK, well, I'll just do, I'll just do two laps. And he, he must have done about 15, 20 laps. And like I say, the very next day, they rang up and bought one to, to have a look at. It was, um, yeah, the R35 was, was amazing. And it's been the, 
the foundations for, for the really successful business you've got now. But let me rewind one minute. Evo Car of the Year. You were involved in a fantastic story on Evo Car of the Year. Um, I love this. I'm going to allow you to tell it um, because it's just so good. Uh, yeah, I presume you're, meant, you're talking about crashing a noble. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it, was, it still <laughs> remains probably the single most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> and having to go, having to go and explain to Harry, we're in Italy, that uh, we just crashed the Noble trying to avoid an oncoming truck, um, and we sort of totaled it down one side, and then for the rest of the shoot, they're having to take photographs from just one angle. So, that, but it was one of those things. I can't remember. I must have been like 22, 23, maybe even less than that. And we were driving the most incredible cars up and down these mountain roads without even thinking really what we were doing just thinking how lucky we were to be driving these cars and then that happened and then instantly you kind of grow up and think oh, what if i'd done it in the speciale whatever the, whatever the car was it's the, the ferrari whatever the special edition was at the time or the gt3 that had just come out or the and uh, yeah it was it wasn't good it wasn't a good look the big no-no back in the day during those tests was was having someone from another car company crash someone else's car and they were they were very tricky they were very tricky events to manage and and i tell you what the noble connection is quite ironic because a couple of years after that someone from noble got in a ford gt and wrote it off at rockingham when i was there so i suppose what goes around comes around but it was, you, to, to try and manage those days was impossible because you, you you invited everyone along with their cars but they would often send quite senior chassis and powertrain engineers because they knew that was their chance to get into rival product that they knew wasn't bent or doctored and in a, and they could also have a control environment. So there was always a battle for the keys. And it was a bit of a nightmare because it was, it was a real worry because you didn't quite know how good a drivers they were. I mean, you assumed they were good, but they weren't always. And you could always guarantee the law of Murphy would insert itself. My favourite one was being at Goodwood for some auto car event. And in those days... TBR were the ones, and they just bought out the Tamora, and the the you know the cars were underdeveloped but fascinating and fast. And Peter Wheeler obviously had a thing against any other British sports car maker, so when his Tamora blew up by the side of the track, properly blew up, as in bits of engine and smoke everywhere, and it turned out that the the, the two people driving in the car were from Lotus. Um, he just went absolutely mental, understandably. And it always seemed to go that way. But yeah, the, the ultimate extension of that was the guy from Noble crashing the Ford GT and me having to go over to the bloke in the Ford truck who almost, I thought he was going to punch me. And he said, who was driving it? And I just went, I don't know. How can you not know? I said, well, I wasn't, I was a freelancer, but I wasn't controlling the people driving the cars. And, we, and no one knew who, who was driving it. And then someone said, oh, it was, I won't say his name. It was uh, from Noble. And the bloke from Ford just went, I think he said you're a fucking disgrace and just loaded what was left of the car up onto the trunk of the truck and left. It was just a bag of bits. It was terrible. Um, yeah. So I know how well, you it, felt, but I love I love the idea that the that that it you it wasn't like you were Walter Rawl on, on from Porsche. You were basically you and your mate Curtis from Cheltenham with your tuned Subaru <laughs> and you just fired a noble into a ditch. It was it was yeah it, we were we were young and driving way too fast for our ability and as we came round this like hairpin bend there was just a lorry parked in the middle of the road and Curtis had one of two options it was either head on with the lorry or try and go down a ditch and uh, he went with the ditch and it just it totaled the side of that uh, of that noble for the rest of the shoot because it was quite early on as well what did Harry, Harry say Harry, Harry can be quite I, rental but he can also be very good what did he say uh, he was furious. <laughs> he was furious. It was no parental. I think it was, he was both angry with us and angry in the whole situation that it even, how did this happen? How, how are we whizzing around in these expensive cars? Because obviously they had, they'd have teams of photographers out photographing the slow stuff. Journalists would be out testing it and then there'd be cars available to drive effectively. So you jump in it and, and whiz up up and down a mountain road, and uh, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a good look. So fast forward, R thirty five, this uncrackable ECU. How long did it take to crack it? 
got about half an hour, I think. The boys, <laughs> the boys at Equitech in Uxbridge were pretty quick on it. Yeah, very quick. Um, but the car, uh, it, was the, it was the dream ticket for you, wasn't it? Because you had the, what you need, it seems to me, in your world, is you need a car that's fundamentally strong and clever technically, but it's got, but leaves you enough problems to solve that are worth solving and also enough window to take it to new performance areas. And the R35 had all that, didn't it? It was massive. I think from a business point of view, it was, it was superb. It came right at the point of the recession as well. So we were very fortunate with it where you had um, a lot of uh, company owners that would normally have Porsches or Ferraris couldn't be seen to be buying a new one. So they effectively looked like they were downgrading to a, to a Nissan. You had the Subaru Evo guys that were progressing up to the GTR. And obviously the reviews were fantastic. So it was, it was held in a perfect storm during a you know, really bad time. So where our Subaru business effectively died out overnight, luckily we were still very busy with GTR. So from a business point of view, that, that worked well. Um, they were particularly awkward to deal with in terms of dealers for servicing and things, very expensive. So that gave us a window in to looking after the cars, which went well. Um, but from a tuning point of view, it, it was, they designed the car for considerably more power and then turned it right back. So for us, it just opened up a massive potential for performance. And, and it was like nothing else we'd seen, like you say, outside of a Veyron or something like that. And even then, you know, a, a, a half decent tuned GTR would show the heels to a, to a Veyron as it is. So, <laughs> it's you know. a ridiculous statement. They, they were, the when, when they first arrived, they were exceptionally good value, weren't they? And they were like 45 grand or something. And then the, this and right, brought yeah. on to how cheap they were and whacked the price up to like 67 grand overnight. They were, yeah, we were bringing them in at sort of just under 50. And then they came in at 52, 900 for the first year. And then they, they quickly went up, which I, I think, I'm not sure it was their plan, but it's helped keep the values. The values of the GTR have remained exceptionally strong. So a good one now is still going to set you back 30, 35,000. So it's yeah. an appreciation curve over this considerable time. It's, it's not a bad buy. I remember that time I was running the, Ferrari, the old Ferrari dealership then, and we were buying and selling like so many GTRs and R8s. And probably because exactly what you said, people didn't want to be seen buying the latest Ferrari and you know, a, a GTR would come in, another one would go out. We, we would, well, I, I think I must've sold a hundred cars. Mm. They're good business. They've always been good business. And because yeah. they're, they're so stable in the used market, it made it very easy to sell because it was a, it was a known quantity for both the buyer and the seller. And it, it made it very easy to deal with. But it, this, this also refers back to what we're talking about with the Yaris GR suspension. How much of what you've developed on the, on the GTR and, and for those that don't, no, go and have a look at Ian's website. The, the developed work he's done on the car is so far beyond anyone else really in Europe and also probably within the factory. I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've met people at Nissan and at Nismo who, so when you say the word Litchfield, their eyes sort of roll as if to say, God, that bloke's just obsessed um, because he's done so much. But how much of it is commercial? How much of it is you just not being able to leave alone? Because you just can't, you can't leave it alone, can you? That's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. There's a lot of stuff we've developed that we just don't need need of need to do we've spent the last eight six weeks working on a gtr engine on the engine dyno basically repeating what we already know just because we've got a new engine dyno it's working and we can test all these things again so um but that's half the fun you know developing an engine or a billet block or a, we're quite lucky in the uk that we've got some unbelievable engineering companies here so it's fascinating to work with those top people and where they would normally be doing projects for manufacturers and they they do their small elements of it and then never see it again with someone like ourselves when we work with them they can see the end product they can see the results they're getting from or we're getting from it so it, it that works really well and we've always been lucky that we're not tied to any we're not tied to any manufacturer so we can we can just cherry pick the best cars so we get to work with yaris because we want to um you know, we get to work with some of the BMW products, Porsche products, this Nissan products, because we want to, not because we have to. And that's always worked well. And then we, you know, naturally have like-minded customers that like the same thing. The, uh, so, yeah, a couple of things on that. One, working with these bigger suppliers or, or these more professional engineering companies does bring a risk, though, because, you know, your premises is so much bigger than it, you know, used to be. And you must look around and think, how did this happen? Which, it, you know, fair play, boss. Um but then I, I, I was in the in the in the um, parts department at one point with you, 
and you had a delivery of Alcon brakes or something or exhaust headers or something. And I thought, Jesus Christ, you're having to buy a lot of these things to justify working with these big partners. You must, at some point a while ago, you must have gone, this has got very grown up, having to write very big checks to get this stuff made. It is, and it's it's both uh, an issue and, and a benefit because, you know, for Alcon, for example, very good at what they do, brakes, um, but they have huge lead times. And nobody comes into us necessarily wanting breaks. They come in for service, they might need breaks. So we can't wait eight weeks, 12 weeks for them to make some breaks. You have to have rolling stock orders, which becomes expensive to make sure you've got everything you need at that point. And then you have big projects. We work with like Bilstein on our GTR suspension. For the first time we did it with them, we had to pay some money for the development work and we had to buy 50 sets of dampers and suspension. Well, that was a way more than the cost of a Nissan GTR on the basis that people would buy it. Luckily, we've we've sold quite a few since. Um, but yeah, you have to kind of speculate to accumulate a bit. And did they want, um, did they want, want, a, did they want a 25 grand bung on top of that? <laughs> no, they just want it's too simple business. But when you're dealing with a company of that size and we're the size that we are, they, you know, as, as much goodwill as they have towards us, you still have to put in what to us is a sizable order. To them, it's, it's next to nothing. Um, and they actually had to okay it with Nissan to allow them to sell us the dampers. And luckily, Nissan uh, liked what we were doing and said that was okay. So, you know, without Nissan giving the go-ahead, we never would have, we never would have had it. So the Nissan thing has been the basis of the business. If you go to Ian's premises, I'm there too often, um, then there's always about 35 or 40 GTRs outside. It's bizarre. You, you, you will never see so many in one place unless you're a sort of specialist owner's meeting, I would have thought. Uh, but you've... You start, you're starting to branch out now. You know, it's the, the, R, the R35 GTR can't be around much longer. It's become a very expensive, rare car, um, and they're getting older. And, you know, inevitably, people will probably spend a bit less on them, although it's still incredibly busy, isn't it? That, that, that's not your five, ten-year plan now. It can't be, can it? So you've got, you got into BMWs. Because I went up there one day, and I always assumed you were Mr. Japanese. So when there was an M2 there, I was like, what, what are you doing with that? You went, oh, we're having a play with one of these. You wouldn't believe how much power we can get one of these. Sure enough. Once Litcher got his paws on a on an M2, um, he got some amazing results. And you're you're flying with those things, aren't you? Yeah, we, we do a lot of BMWs. We, we we got the when it when we knew they were being turbocharged. We'd had eight, I've had most of the M3s before, um, and then when we knew they were going turbocharged with the M4, we we bought an M4 in 2014. Really did all our development work on that. That naturally flowed into the M2, and we do huge amounts, and we do at least one or two a day um, of those, and they just brilliant cars they're just such good value so much fun larry fun cars you know they're they're great so and strong yeah, exceptionally yeah probably the most reliable engine we've, we've worked with they have a problem with a crank hub which is easy to fix and then after that they're they're bomb proof literally bomb proof even dct gearbox can handle the silly power you get from them yeah they're fine we've never had one problem with dct but i think it's almost exactly the same dct that's in the m5 so that's running considerable power from the factory i think that just the german stuff is well engineered you see that with porsche as well it's 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 done properly um and your next thing so you're always speculating looking around so the other day well so probably last year i was up at your place and you had a mclaren there 720s and i thought oh here we go What's he up to now? So you've had a play with one of those and the power figures you've got from it are absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, 720 makes monster power. We did one the other week, it was 880 with an exhaust and a remap. Um, <laughs> just nuts. Undrivable, undrivably quick through the rear wheels. We've got a, we had a 720, but I realised that that market probably wasn't the main market for us. So we then, we sold that after we did the development work and then moved down to the 570. So we've done quite a lot of work on the 570. So, so you'd have to have a drive of that now. That's got um, a mechanical diff in the back, um, some suspension work, some more power. It's it's really good, really, really good. And that's and so, yeah, I can so I can see the strategy there. So that's a car that looks amazing value. So if you buy, if you, can, if you can rob one cheap, go and spend 20 grand with you on some bits and bobs, you've got an absolute weapon, haven't you? Yeah, it's a, I think uh, the, the philosophy has always been about following our customers so we have good customers and they might have a gtr move on to mclaren or porsche and we want to make sure that we're still catering for that customer rather than sort of blindly following just a particular brand 
Um, and it's worked quite well so far. And plus, we get to drive amazing cars. None of them are bad cars to begin with. They're amazing. We just have to, to work around the edges of them. What, um, so what does the future bring? I've, um, it's interesting. There's a lot of talk on forums that the later M2 CSs, I mean, you do very well with comps, um, but the later um, CSs from sort of after June build have a different Bosch ECU that's more difficult to crack. Um, so maybe the tunability of those cars is going to be difficult. Let's face it, we're coming to the end of the internal combustion engine and it's not inconceivable that some politician will turn around and say, well, this, why should you be able to tune a car and make it emit a bit more of this and that than they say from the factory? What happens to you guys then? How do you go, how do you get around that? Well, we, I mean, we, it's tricky to get around it. Um, we've, constantly working on diversifying the business so we're not entirely reliant on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the latest Boss ECUs currently can't be tuned, but we're pretty confident in the next uh, weeks and, and months that we'll have something to offer. Um, I think if those companies decide to lock things down, they can do um, and, and stop people from getting in, but there'll always be loopholes. You know, humans programmed it after all. Um, and uh, yeah, and then, then we can have some fun fun with the cars. But it'd be interesting to see what happens with the electric cars. Obviously, they've still got suspension and tires and wheels yeah. and brakes and everything else that needs uh, tuning. And if anything, I prefer the suspension side than anything else. But as of yet, nobody's really tuning electric cars. Um, it's so going to happen. Isn't it? There's going to be someone yeah, with I a very so. big forehead wearing a white coat that's going to get yeah. 2,000 horsepower from a Tesla Model 3. It must be there. It will be interesting to see what they can do with it. I really do because you, I wonder how much, I wonder how much capacity is left in these electric cars, you know, because they don't fully understand them. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they could do an awful lot more than they're, they're kind of letting on at the minute. I think also so in the talk, the, the, the big when I first drove the Taycan Turbo S, it, it was the torque vectoring, talking to the chassis engineer that was the most fascinating. He said, "Look, I've spent two years." Trying to calibrate this, and I and I haven't I haven't got exactly where I want to get to, but we're putting it to market because we're happy with it. It meets sort of Porsche standards. He said, but I could do this for another five years. Mm. The infinite possibilities available, and what we what we're learning means that it's just going to get better week by week. So there's going to be a lot of fun there. Yeah, is, this, I, I think the, we, is the Tesla Roadster still coming? Not till yeah, 2022 so. at the moment. They 20, say. I, I I saw again that video the other day of when they originally launched it, launching itself out the back. It's just unreal. Well, we we got to Tesla when they very first came to the UK, so we wanted to make sure we had one of the first cars to see what we could do with it. And I went around the factory uh, again. One of the uh, Aston Martin engineers we met back with GTR have now worked at Tesla, so he invited us around the factory when we were in the US. That was interesting. But what became apparent very quickly um, was that it's going to be like an iPhone where it just obsoletes itself so fast that by the time you spent any money with, you know, researching and, and developing something, they just moved on to something faster. So yeah. then it was the four wheel drive Tesla. Then it was the ludicrous mode. Then it was ludicrous mode. Plus you can't compete or, or, or try to get involved in that market. And then we had a, um, uh, a Taycan for six months uh, last year and it's unbelievable how good that car is but you know the next one is going to be not just a slight improvement it's going to be a big jump forward so it's 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 something we'd rather just sit back and watch maybe for this next generation of cars and see see what happens because I think if you get too involved you'll 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 get bogged down by it all and I've moved on I love you I just I do find it really heartwarming to see how much people like you love the challenge of it when i was there by chance when when he uh, ian bought his first yaris back before christmas and um all the boys it was the end of the day it was gone half five they could have all gone home and there was 20 lads in a workshop uh and ian drove in and, and they were literally pulling it apart they were like rats over this thing pulling it apart, poking it. Oh, look at that intake there. That's going to be hot. We can do something with that. How hot's the air going in there? Everyone was poking around it with this kind of energy to, to try and see what they could do to extract more performance from the basic package. And I, I looked at that and I thought, yeah, this is a commercial environment. Maybe this is what made me want to send that tweet yesterday. I just saw a load of people that are really into the subject that have poured 
a lot of time and effort into that car to make it a bit better or to you know to try and do something different with it it's not going to make anyone rich it really isn't oh. it's, you know it isn't going to make anyone rich you can but you get rich in other areas but you're not doing too badly boss i'll give well play but that isn't going to make you rich and the idea of of someone saying well i'm going to let you do all this work and spend all this time and invest all this love into this thing but i want you to basically give me the sum total of what you might ever make from it to be associated with me is bollocks and i don't care who you are it's bollocks yeah yeah I um, agree. but okay. uh but i but i dude i think it, we'll, uh, you you did say obviously um that as an advert you obviously choosing which is the, in your commercial interest which is the best uh yaris tuner who is the best yaris tuner <laughs> Uh, for me, uh, I definitely go. I personally would go with Licho, but that's because he has given me ten grand to say that. I can tell you now. No, no, stay that, stock, keep it stock. Yeah, 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 Ian Litchfield has never given me a penny. Occasionally, I get offered a cup of tea, but I watch him. This is pre-COVID. I used to watch him kind of swill the mug with he his hand. Use an old tea bag. Use an old like, tea oh, bag. Oh Jesus Christ! Where's that come from? Uh, no, it's uh, it's if, if you if you're into the subject, go and visit him near Tewkesbury because uh, it's amazing what he can do with your BMW. Certainly, the suspension kit on my uh, on my M2 Comp, you know, and I can say this because I uh, if it was shit, I'd say it was shit. But my problem with the M2 is I love the car, but the ride is just too hard. I just don't understand modern road cars why they have to be so busy and jiggly, and they have to find cambers and just. But this this kit just takes it all away, you know. Just adds a load of of um, of refinement, and and it makes it lovely. And I've got an Akrapovich exhaust on there, which because in is a dealer for Akrapovich. And this, I've had a couple of bits and bobs that weren't very expensive off them. But this one, I wrote a ch I wrote a check for this. Didn't know there's an invoice somewhere. I'm sure I paid some money for it. It's a mega exhaust. It's gorgeous. It's just when you got the button open. It's probably too loud for someone of my age uh, and my ethnicity. It's not helpful to be making that level of noise. You look like a bit of a cock, if I'm honest with you. So I'd like it in between button, Mr. Kravovich, if I can have one. But uh, no, he, he does some great work. And I, I'm happy to say that. And if he's if he's done something I thought was not very good, I'd say it as well. I've not come across it yet. But uh, well, I, don't think, I think we know, we, know, it works. we know the subject well enough to know not to give you something. There's certain cars we've had recently as demo cars that we we told you that you won't be getting or you can't have because they're no good. <laughs> yeah. I could think of, I could think of another uh, Toyota also, recently. Let's talk, and let's be honest about it. it doesn't always work for you. The Focus RS when it came out, I remember talking to you, you said, yeah, this is right up our street. This is they're gonna make loads of them, there's quite a lot you can do with it. it didn't work for you, did it? No, in fact, we've actually stopped tuning them now. They're more trouble than they're worth. So we we've um we stopped doing it. And you have to you can't do everything so you have to pick your battles really and then choose what you want and you have to be interested in the car you know we're not some cars we're not as interested in so we're just not going to put the time and effort into developing stuff for it because it you quickly realize that the fundamentals aren't there and no matter how much you do to it it's still going to be hamstrung by the base car underneath you spoke about sam's carrera t i don't know whether he had, I believe he had the same full engine pack you've got on yours but i've driven ian's that's a worrying motor vehicle if you've got a, a the 911 GT3 Touring like I have, and you drive Licho's Carrera T, your mind is never to tangle with one of the traffic lights ever again, because his car's much faster than mine. It's, it's a, a weapon. Car. It's a good car, very good car. Yeah. Is that the green oh, one, Ian? Yeah, green one. It is, yeah. No, uh, okay, well, I th I th do you think we've, just, I think we've, I think we've, we've done that. I think we've exhausted the, the, the influencer thing. Like I said, I want to summarise I've got no beef with anyone personally. I just think it was wrong. I don't think it's in the spirit of of that side of the industry. I don't think there's enough money floating around really to be to be um, hardballing that kind of cash out of people. I, like I've said, if you want to go to a big OEM, big car maker, and do yourself a deal to to be a shrill, that's absolutely up to you. Make make your money and enjoy it. Um, and also, I, I I I respect people that stick their head above the parapet. And go for something, and if it doesn't work, but if it doesn't work out, I think you have got to put your hands up and go, oh, I've "Got that bit wrong." I've yet to see that, um, uh, and uh, you know, no one's no one's ever been castigated for having a go. But there's there's a brazenness about this one that was probably a bit tricky. So we've covered that off. I also think that we've covered off the the Litro journey, which is amazing. And if you've got an if you've got an M2 or an, or an M3 and M4, 
particularly the M2 though. It's just a great car. If you've got one of those, go and have a go in, in something that Ian's played with because it is, um, let's just say, it releases another side of the car's personality. It's remarkable. Uh, but likewise, Porsche, McLaren, and um, and you know what? When, this is, when's, this the fir- sound- when's the first new M4 coming your way in? Ah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I have to get into body kits, I think, for the new M4. <laughs> to do something. I, I've <laughs> got to say that they're, they're colour sensitive. Chris, you you were pretty uh, outspoken about this when they launched it, but I, it, I'm warming. I'm warming to it already. Yeah, but I, I, you know, I'm I'm I love being proved wrong. When I first saw it, I just thought. Jesus Christ, you know, that's a face a mother couldn't love. But BMW have a habit of, of releasing stuff that's a bit shocking, and over time you do mellow to it. And a lot of Bangle stuff um, was like that, although I think the Bangle was a design movement that was cerebral, and I think they had a lot of thinking behind it. It was cleverer than this. Uh, but you, you never know. I, I don't think I'll ever grow to love it. I think for me, it's more of a problem is down the side of the car. It doesn't You know, there's a, there's a sort of tension down the side of the F80 that is... It's one of the great-looking fast saloon cars, particularly the four-door, I think. Um, Chris, you'll, you'll like this. I, I made an inquiry to buy an M4 um, this week, and I was told I, I can't buy it because I'm on the resellers list because I sold my Mini GP3, which, when I bought it, I said to the dealer, I don't want it, but if you want me to take it, I'll take it. So he was like, fine, take it. So I took now it. Now you're on the... Now you're on the other. Yeah, the stuff on collecting cars lost five hundred quid, so I sold it for under list, <laughs> and I'm still on the resellers list. <laughs> you've always been, you've always been a flipper, mate. You've always been a flipper. <laughs> what you need to do is, have you got any, have you got any family connections with BMW dealership? No, <laughs> no I'm, on a, I'm a flipper. I'm a flipper. <laughs> um, no, I think um, what I like is though. Yesterday, it all is all a bit noisy. Um, and there was a lot, you know, and I say for me, it's lighthearted joshing. No one's, you know, dying over this. It's, it's just not serious. But Licho got a lot more publicity yesterday in one day from that nonsense than he would have done paying 25 sovs to be involved in that. So ultimately, the little man, well, Licho's not little, look at the size of him, uh, but uh, <laughs> the little guy succeeded. Uh, and I think that was um, maybe a lesson we can all learn from it. But, uh, mate, great to speak to you, Licho. I know you, you you've got to go and talk to someone else this afternoon, so you're going to have a very sort of vocal cords. I'll be up uh, uh, later in the week to um, do some bits and bobs. But, uh, Edward, great to speak to you as well. Uh, Ian, uh, yeah, have a good 2021. I hope that things continue to go well. And um, hope you. we can be involved in more joshing and controversy uh, over the next 20 years. So, from collecting cars... Uh, and this unusual Zoom format. Uh, This is us checking out. Thanks a lot. Bye all. Bye-bye all.